Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with me, Glenn Bartley, and where's Yan? Well, I'll tell you where Yan is. He's out in the field right now, testing out the Nikon Z9 and some different lenses. So why don't we go see what Yan is up to? Yes, I'm just out here, actually on a car park where a lot of these super cool bush donk girls hang out and they have these really amazing, kind of bizarre bird calls. So you can see it's still pretty dark, I'm shooting at high ISO, low shutter speeds, wide open, but not a problem for the Z9 and the 100-400mm lens. Some of the birds are in a more open area, but the majority of the birds actually kind of stands amongst the trees, so almost on the road. So I'm actually just trying to sneak up to one of the birds now and zoom in all the way to 400mm to get a really nice headshot because a full body shot just doesn't work as you get the street or the cars behind the bird but if we actually zoom in to a nice headshot we can get beautiful colors so by just going to the right position and looking for some nice bright colors in the background I can actually get this beautiful footage and you would never think it was taken on a car park. I'm actually seeing now a few of the birds heading over to that open area again. They were there in the beginning but then they took off. Let me sneak up over there again and see if I can get some shots because that would be really nice. With the open area I will just be able to get a much nicer background. So I actually managed to get in a bit closer getting some more headshots of this guy here. He's walking around. Um, I'm probably going to try to lie down on the ground and get some more video. Oh wow, look at that. Perfect timing. Nice yawn. And being on the ground here just allows me to get a more stable position and get a really nice angle on this bird right in front of me. From the corner of my eye I can also see a few lapwings sneaking around. Let me just kind of try to get a shot of them. This was a little bit unexpected but I'd definitely take a beautiful head portrait of these stunning birds with those beautiful yellow wattles and I really like the sunlit background in this image as well. I think on that high note, it's time to wrap up and head back to the studio where I can see all of you guys. Nikon is definitely back in the game. And you know who else is back? Yan is back. I am back. <laughs> just... Welcome back, Yan. Yeah, that was quite a fun little shoot, just taking out the camera into the field, seeing what it's all about, because it's definitely doing very well, pretty good autofocus and this 100 to 400 millimeter lens is actually really nice as well, really good image stabilization so especially for video it's very nice to hold it handheld and while it's quite heavy for 100 to 400 combo it's still definitely also very hand holdable. And on the way home I actually managed to stop at another spot where I saw some bar shoulder doves and that looked like a great birds in flight opportunity so why don't we look at that video right now. So after the curlies I found myself another target there's a few bar shoulder doves over there and they're sitting on these branches and then fly to another area where they're feeding so I'm trying to get some flight shots now Z9 1.4 extenders because the birds are pretty small Nikon 100 to 400 f8 which is wide open ISO 3200 2 thousandths of a second light is sort of nice and overcast and what I do I focus on the bird while it's just sitting on the branch and then it's just a waiting game at the moment I'm using the wide area large which seems to work the best always try to focus on the bird while it's on the perch so when it jumps off I already track it there we go missed that one it's the waiting game you don't want to miss the moment when it jumps there we go Yes, I think I got some nice shots in that one. And here we have my raw file. Then we have the raw file with the process applied. And then my final edited image. And if you guys want to learn all about image editing and how to make your own bird images stand out, make sure to check out my masterclass, ebooks, and process down there in the description. Well, you definitely got some great results with that Nikon gear, that's for sure. Now, of course, yeah, the million dollar question, or at least the 30 thousand dollar question is are you going to be switching to Nikon? I really enjoy using the gear but obviously once you accumulated so much Canon gear you're so familiar with the one system it would actually be quite a big change for me to switch. The camera is very good the main thing for me really is at the moment there isn't that many Nikon lenses that I feel like I would want to have like this 100 to 400 is very good but it's a tiny bit short so I'd probably prefer the longer reach of the 100 to 500 although it works really well with a 1.4 extender so it's a bit of a wash really but there's no big 
Z mount prime lens at the moment that really excites me. They have the new 800 millimeter lens. I know you've been looking at that as well. That looks like a really cool lens, but 800 for me, it's too long as my base focal length. I like having the flexibility of the 600 millimeters and at least for now, there is no real offering there. I remember a tour I was leading years ago in Ecuador and this one guy, most people had 500s and 600s and this one guy had an 800 and we we're trying to set up on this feeder and he had to like sit in the restaurant basically of the place because he had to be back that far just to be able to focus. So it is something that sometimes people forget about is all these characteristics of the lens. The minimum focus distance on these big telephotos can certainly be one of the, of the key things to look at. So I was obviously joking when I said, I know you're not switching to Nikon, but the reality is, is that Nikon's doing some really good things. The Z9 is definitely a very good camera. From what I've seen from, from your reviews and from some other ones that I've watched, they're definitely doing interesting things as a company. They've come up with a good camera. They're adding good features to it. It sounds like the video is awesome from what you told me. They're coming out with cool and attractively priced lenses, like that 800, really interesting. So like if they do the same thing with like a 500 and a, well, they already have the 500 PF, but if they made like a 600 that was around that same price point and had good characteristics, all of a sudden they start to look pretty appealing, especially if you're starting from scratch without any existing gear. In the end, all these cameras are very similar and one will work better in the one area and then another one will work better in the other area. So it's really hard to say for me these days that one is like far superior than the other. It always seems Canon has the best sort of subject recognition. It just knows more mm -hmm. what a bird is. If it comes to a body, I think the camera body I prefer at the moment would be the R3. In terms of where all the buttons sit and the multi-controller at the back and just how it feels and the weight, it's almost 400 grams lighter than a Z9 as well. So it's a huge difference there. Wow. And it just lies really nicely in your hand. So if I had to pick just the body, ignoring anything else at the moment, I would definitely reach for an R3. Just everything is just exactly where your fingers are basically. So that has been very nice to use in yeah. the field. All three of the major brands, of course, I'm talking about Sony, Nikon, and Canon, haven't yet filled in that lower price point segment. There's this sort of gap in the lower end of the market that that's where we're really gonna see, I think, what these companies have to offer is when they start filling in that lower tier, because that's what the majority of photographers are gonna be using. Well, there are some offerings, but I feel like they're so far behind in terms of the specs that they're also not really a consideration. I think yeah. Nikon has a Z50 that's a little bit cheaper and that that's a crop camera, I think. Okay. And then you have the Canon R and RP, but I feel like compared to an R6, they're not really a good choice. In Sony, if you want cheaper, you'd have to go for the teeny tiny APS-C bodies, but then you wouldn't put that on like a 600 millimeter lens or something. So there's definitely yeah. room to have some cheaper offerings. And I think that that's what we're going to likely see at least announced later this fall. That's certainly what some of the rumor sites are suggesting. I feel like we're going to see the lower end stuff fill in and then back up top. That's my guess. That's possible. I mean, the only thing is with the supply chain issues, if you can only make a certain amount of cameras, you would obviously opt for making the expensive ones that you can still sell out basically, as opposed to making really cheap ones where your margin is very small. So if you have to divide your resources between a camera you make 400 bucks on and a camera you make 4,000 bucks on, I guess the choice is pretty easy. And I think that's part yeah, of why we're point. seeing so much expensive gear right now, because with the limited resources going for the highest margin products probably makes sense. Well, we'll find out soon enough. We'll just keep our eyes. And Jan's been doing a great job with his early bird photo news videos. So make sure you stay tuned into those on his channel. And One thing that I found quite interesting, as you saw in the video as well, that I was always trying to focus on the dove while it was on the perch and then anticipate the takeoff and just try to track it when it takes off. But what would happen? Usually the Z9 and 100 to 400 would kind of lose tracking of the bird and were trying to get onto the background. But when I actually took my finger off the AF on button to stop the focus, kept tracking the bird and then refocus, it would actually pretty easily find the bird again in flight and then give me a couple seconds of another chance. And that's when I basically got all the images. So I think that's 
a technique maybe you have to learn if the camera is not able to track the bird the whole time it can sometimes be worthwhile to still obviously try and keep it in the viewfinder and if you notice the camera does something wrong stop focusing kind of reset and refocus and you might get the shot the the camera is capable of grabbing a subject much quicker than it used to be so yeah. it sort of presents a different style of flight shooting so what about you glenn usually whenever we do an episode you've just come home from some epic crazy trip to somewhere so I'm sure that's the case this time as well, isn't it? I was just down in Mexico where I really hadn't spent much time. So a lot of the birds were, were really new for me and there's some really fantastic stuff to chase after there. So this gives you an idea of what the typical conditions are like down here on the coast of Mexico, birding in this dry sort of scrubby forest. Some really amazing birds here to find, like the orange-breasted bunting, russet-capped motmot, -mot, some really awesome things. So I'm gonna keep searching, but at least you can kind of get a sense of what the habitat around here looks like. So how did you go down there? It probably sounds pretty hot and dry when I think of Mexico. Well, you'd be right. I mean, <laughs> it was definitely the dry season. It was a good season to be there as far as like birds and breeding activity and stuff like that. But it was sunny every single day. I did not see one drop of rain. I basically maybe had, in, in a three week shoot, I maybe had maybe two hours with clouds. The rest of the time it was sunny, dry, and super hot. Zero lodges in Mexico where I was, zero feeders, not one bird eating a banana anywhere in sight. So 100% field photography, walking around dusty, dry dirt roads, listening for the birds, looking for the birds trying to figure out what the right habitats where they might want to be is. So it's, it's a really challenging shoot, but that's what I actually live for. That's what I love to do as a, as a wildlife photographer. Having sunshine all day long really hurts you because it really limits the time you have. Essentially have to look for like cloudy areas or you're limited to like two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. Definitely the middle of the day on this trip was a complete write-off. I mean, the sun gets high, there's no shade to be found. And also just the heat. I mean, animals, whether they're birds or mammals or whatever, when it's that hot, they are not out actively flying around. One of the reasons why maybe people don't know this, but most bird migration happens at night. Yeah, I know that experience when we were road tripping in the Northern Territory is also like 40 degrees, bright sun every day. And at least there was some mountains. So in the morning, you'd always try to find some deep, dark valley and then walk into it, hope the yep. sun wouldn't come up over it. And then I remember shooting these white line honey eaters and they were there, but every 20 minutes I had to move further into the valley because the sun <laughs> caught up with me kind of ruining the shot. So it's definitely more challenging, but I'm sure you got some birds at least. Oh, totally. No, I make it sound doom and gloom here a little bit. And like, it was like, oh yeah, I made the best of it. It was actually an amazing trip. I kind of have a hit list of birds that I think I'll be able to get the most interesting ones, the most beautiful ones. And I pretty much cleaned them off the table. I got some really nice shots of this chestnut sided shrike vireo. There's this beautiful warbler, the red warbler, stunning crimson red with this white. So just a beautiful, beautiful birds. And then the two other ones that like just jumped off the page for me when I was looking through the Mexican field guide were these two different buntings. The so one is the orange breasted bunting and then the other one used to be called uh, Rosita's bunting and they've changed the name to the rose bellied bunting. It's just this amazing like electric blue and then this super bright yellow going into this orange and then on his head it's this cool like lime green. Just a very very beautiful bird. So it looks like you edited a lot of images in a record amount of time again for us to see on this show. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I get home from a trip, I always like to get a, a nice portfolio out fairly quickly. And I can tell you that that has become a fair bit easier now that we've got our pro sets because it just saves me so much time when it comes to the raw processing phase. I mean, of course, you still go into Photoshop and do a lot of other work, but that initial, I, I kept about 400 images from this trip out of... 40,000 that I took and but 400 is still a lot to deal with and using our pro sets just that sort of one click to get you to a great starting point just saves me so much time when it comes to that stage of my editing workflow and then of course I like to be efficient in Photoshop so I have developed a bunch of actions and things and if you want to learn about those you can check out my ebooks the link is down in the description. 
And actually what turned out to be a really good strategy for them, it was interesting, they would be in their forest, in their territories, but they there was sort of this wide um, road going down to the beach. And I noticed really on the first day that I was in the right area that they would come out to sort of the grasses and stuff and they would be like feeding in the grasses. And then if a car drove by, they'd like fly back into the forest. So just driving that that road, you could actually find them and then sort of know where their territory was and, and yeah. kind of get to work. So it was awesome to sort of, while I was in the right habitat, you'd see many of them every day. And it was, you were just never, never sad to put your binoculars up and see this electrifying bird in your binoculars or your viewfinder. Well, it's nice that for once you actually have a nice bird that seems to cooperate and is also abundant. So <laughs> yeah. that would make it quite fun. Yeah, it does for sure. And I think on that high, it's probably time to wrap up this show. Like always, we're grateful for all of you guys watching and we really appreciate if you give us a sound thumbs up for this video, leave us your thoughts down there in the comments and subscribe to the channel. And we will see you guys in the next video very soon. Bye. See you next time, guys.